You, you may want to know what the significance is of that, all right? It's, it's kind of like how I increasingly feel at conferences these days, all right? Um, two years ago, I was asked to speak at the Academic European Complexity Science Conference as an opening keynote on why models don't work on human systems. Uh, nobody told me the entire audience consists of academics who built models for existence, all right? <laughs> <clears throat> it then got quite interesting, but fortunately the other keynote was Mary Gelman, who is far more famous than I am. And he famously said, you know, the only valid model of a human system is the system itself. Okay? Now that actually is quite significant, because that was a driver for me when I started this work 20 years ago in IBM, right? before I left 12 years ago. And now one of the issues about understanding human systems is a model can't represent the full complexities of what goes on which is not to say that modelers make that claim, but people assume that the claim is there after the model is built. Yeah? So I'm going to talk about some of the work we're doing to make systems represent themselves in real time. Yeah? So actually you don't have to model it because the system is, is representing itself in such a way that you have a model. So I'm going to come on to that in a minute. Right? And I was in the Melbourne at the simulation conference uh, two weeks ago, um, opening keynote. I mean, that was nice. It was a few thousand people, auditorium type stuff. And the entire conference is people who do computer-based simulations. And I'm there to say that they're severely limited in what they do. And actually, human-based games are more effective than computer simulations. <coughs> and I feel this is the third in the sequence, all right? So we'll see how this works. Right? Um, how many people are into Agile here, by the way? I'm just trying to check. Yeah, OK, fair amount. Um, I really want to start off, and I'm known for, for being a pragmatic cynic, cynic all right? My, always, my view generally is cynics in the organization are the ones who care about it because they're prepared to complain, all right? They're not just going along with things. So for me, cynicism is, is kind of like a positive statement. Yeah? Uh, but it may mean that you find me a little bit negative. Well, sorry, kind of like there's some bad things going on at the moment, and I want to start off with those, all right? So what I'm going to do is, is sort of really target what I think are three major problems that we have in IT generally and Agile specifically. Yeah? And I'm not going to take any prisoners when I do that. Right? Uh, I then want to move on to talk about how we take a natural science approach to human systems, not a case-based approach. Yeah, and that actually is quite critical. Then I'm going to build the science and talk about some of the applications. So that's the sort of schema um, for today. So let's start off with some of the problems we've got. Um, the first... And this is actually a phrase from a friend of mine who writes for both the New Statesman and the Sunday Times, a phenomenon he calls gladwellism, yeah? um, which is the hard sell of a big theme supported by dubious, incoherent, but dramatically presented evidence. Right? Uh, if anybody's into Malcolm Gladwell, then tipping point ain't bad, but after that he started to believe his own myth. And if anybody takes Blink seriously, then please do not tell anybody who knows anything whatsoever about cognitive neuroscience because you will lose every single bit of credibility you've got. Uh, there's a growing tendency, particularly in, in the sort of popular science things, to actually construct the thesis before you capture the evidence, yeah? uh, which is also a trend in management textbooks. I've got a good theory. Let's find the cases to support it. Yeah? You had another example of that. Anybody read Lean Startup? No? OK, not many. OK, it's a very popular book. You guys have escaped the worst um, excesses of this, all right? So this is a guy who goes and interviews people who've been successful in Silicon Valley. And from that, he derives a series of things that they do. And he says, if you do these things, you too will be successful. It's kind of like the confusion of correlation with causation. Yeah? Um, if you want to increase Nobel Prizes by country, increase chocolate consumption. Uh, because Nobel Prizes are directly correlated with chocolate consumption by nation. Right? It's kind of these are little facts you pick up as you go along. Either way, he said he's coming to be successful. You then get this recipe. Everybody's into this at the moment. You know, once you've done three pivots, you're bound to succeed. And I said to a VC the other day, why don't I just do three pivots this weekend and give you three business plans, then you know it's going to work, wouldn't you, all right? Um, now, I remember meeting this guy because we studied this extensively when I was in IBM Research, and we studied companies who failed as well as companies who succeeded. So I asked him if he'd done that elementary bit of research, and he said, no, why would I bother? Well, the answer is, if you actually do that, you discover they do all the same things as the companies who succeed. There really is no difference in the practice. What you've got is a market, and the sheer volume of players means that some will succeed. There isn't a causal relationship between things that you observe. Right? So the sort of crude populism is actually quite scary. Yeah? Uh, you go, it's actually, to be scary, you've seen it in medicine these days. 
Menace is more concerned with statistical correlations with physiological evidence. So it's, it's a tendency moving into science as well, if you look at the, the mess around statins, for example. So that's one problem. The other problem, which you may not hit of yet, and I, I picked this for Australia, but it's entirely appropriate for Berlin to take a scene from um, Cabaret. Uh, this is what I call Magpie 3.0. Some of you may recognize the target on this. Uh, this is where people grab up anything they find bright and shiny which they think people might like, and they throw it together in one or two day courses, uh, which you can buy at extortionate rates. They make money out of it. You're not at any, at any time remotely challenged by the material. The originator never understood it in the first place, but it feels good. Yeah? And the desire to feel good is actually a real danger at the moment. Yeah? And I would say... One of the problems in IT is more money is, is made these days out of training and accreditation than is made out of delivering good software. If we look at where the economic effort is going at the moment, right? And sorry about this, but the idea that you can fill out a multi-choice questionnaire and be given granted a certificate in anything is kind of like deeply dubious mm. in the first place, let alone call yourself a master of it, right? In terms of the way it works. Anybody had the ignominy of safe yet? Scaled agile framework? All right, be grateful, all right? That's a pyramid selling scheme. Um, you do the five-day course that authorizes you to do the three-day course, provided you pay dean a royalty as a result of it. All right? That's called pyramid selling. Yeah? But that is actually dominating industries. It's starting to fail big time. I mean, it's, it's now been abandoned much faster than most of us thought. But you, know, you kind of like all know these sort of things. You may be isolated in data modeling for the full effect of this, but you, know, you, don't, you get the sidewinds. Right? This stuff is very dangerous. Yeah? And the final one, and this worries me even more, is the attempt, and I've used an illustration here from Chaplin's um, famous film, is taking artisan processes and make them into simple two or three day training programs. You can see this with design thinking at the moment. Design thinking, true designers spend 10 or 15 years in various educational apprentice models before they can really design. You can't make it a two day course. Yeah, and that's becoming increasingly a problem across the whole industry sector, and IT is particularly prone to this, Partly it's got budgets. So I really want to challenge this sort of stuff. I also want to challenge the case-based approach. Because if you actually study cases, you're subject to a variety of problems. But it's the way people dominate. Let's go and find people that we think have been successful. Let's identify what they do. And then having identified that, that creates a recipe we can follow. You're all familiar with this type of approach? Yeah? It's kind of like an attempt to use a crude Newtonian concept of physics in a modern age. Yeah? And they say, you've got the correlation causation issue. So let's take good to great. This is one of the classics. Anybody read Good to Great by Jim Collins? OK, some of you. Um, it's a book. It's a Harvard professor. It's one of the most popular, best-selling books of all time. There's a big consultancy practice based on it. He studies a group of companies who've been successful for a long period of time. Well, that kind of like, seems like a good idea, doesn't it? Uh, most of them have failed at the moment, but let's try and, try and pretend that didn't happen <laughs> because that's a bit embarrassing, all right? So we'll, we'll, you know, he's writing a book about why they failed, but we won't talk about that, all right? The, um, so he goes away and studies them, and he's a good academic, so he does all the right work. He does all the right interviews. For some reason, he believes if you interview managers about what they do, that they tell the truth. This is a rather <laughs> you know, illusional belief, but let's just be charitable and actually believe that people who actually are paid for results actually are prepared to be honest about it. I mean... Any ethnographic study contradicts that, but I want to be generous, so let's assume the evidence is right. Yeah? And then from that, he creates a series of methods or tools, because he sees things that these companies do in common. That's the correlation thing. And he's a Harvard professor, so you get things like the hedgehog principle, because branding is important. And then you've got a recipe that you can follow, which means you will be successful by these companies. Yeah? This is a very, very familiar pattern. Yeah? If you look at it with any knowledge whatsoever of evolutionary biology, you say, hang on a minute, you chose the apex predators. Because what happens in ecological science is if an ecology gets disrupted, the then dominant predator, the apex predator, dies out because it's over-specialized for its environment. You know, the dinosaurs when the meteor hits the earth. And the thing which comes through as the next apex predator is the lowest energy cost, most adaptive creature, which is generally the least predictable. If you had to actually forecast at the end of the, you know, the destruction of the Earth by a meteor, you'd have gone for the crocodile or the shark which survived, not the first mammal. Yeah? But the first mammal is small, energy efficient, highly adaptive, so it survives and then becomes a new apex predator. Now, if you look at the companies he chose, he actually chooses apex predators, people who created their market sector. So, of course, when the market changes, they get destroyed. There's a much simpler explanation 
than the causal one he tries to produce. It's a contextual explanation. So, for example, IBM dominates from the 1920s until the 1980s. Yeah? I remember in the 1980s, when we were trying to sell software against IBM, we were doomed. Yeah, you had the best software, you could prove the best performance, but the minute you got close to a sale, the IBM account team came in, and the famous phrase then was, nobody gets fired for buying IBM. If anybody remember, these days, it's nobody gets fired for hiring McKinsey's, and it actually has the same efficacy. All right? it's, a, it, it's a safety prop. Yeah? Um, what then happened is IBM didn't realize that the market had changed from hardware to software. They gave, actually, Bill Gates the IP to, to Windows, even though they owned it. They gave it away. And actually, that failure informed the paranoia of IBM legal departments ever since, all right? If you want to negotiate with a company, find out their failure, then you know the things that they won't concede on, and then life becomes easy, right? Um, so then Microsoft dominate. And remember, kind of like during Microsoft days, you know, despite the fact it's one of the worst operating systems ever invented, and despite the fact it never, sorry, I'm an Apple boy, right? Um, you know, kind of like it dominates. Yeah, just like the IBM PC dominated over the DEC Alpha, yeah, then actually Windows dominates over OS2. It's normally the, the, the highest, fastest adoption. It's not the most effective yeah, or the most efficient yeah, in terms of the pattern. And then Microsoft failed to realize that software wasn't every, everything, and now we see the domination of Apple with a lovely phrase from anthropology, objects of material desire, because that's what Apple did to technology. They moved it away from being things that geeks wanted to objects of material consumer desire, and actually, they couldn't care less. A consumer doesn't mind how things work, provided they work. I don't mind a lock-in. I use entirely Apple techniques, because the presentation I was working on until I stood up is already up to date on all my other devices, and I've got backup, and I don't have to worry about it. Okay? So actually, you can see those dominant periods, and the strategy is to feed off or feed the dominant predator. But during the time of ecological disruption, that's where you get to do something novel. Yeah, so there's a, a basic lesson in strategy. The point I'm trying to get across here is that actually natural science can give us simpler explanations than those which are provided by observation. Another one, thinking fast, thinking slow. Anybody read that one? Yeah, more popular. Yeah, brilliant book, lots of examples. Buy the concept, I'll use it later. But he bo if he bothered to walk across the corridor to his cognitive neuroscience colleagues 10 years before he started his research, we discovered we already knew about that. It's called novelty receptive autonomic processing, which is a much simpler explanation which can scale without the need for the observations. Yeah? Now, I'm making an argument here for actually transdisciplinary research and insight. You can't stay within a narrow field. You've got to broaden the scope. If you broaden the scope, there are radical new ways of looking at things. Yeah? And that kind of like gives us effectively a different model. Um, I'm going to do a two by two matrix here. Um, on one matrix, I want to look at the degree to which something has a scientific method behind it. Right? Um, that means science, science isn't just about identifying data, constructing a hypothesis, and assuming the hypothesis is true. It's about testing the hypothesis to see if it works the next time around, something which social scientists have forgotten about, all right? uh, partly because they could never replicate anyway. Right? Um, the other is where I'm actually I'm assuming that observation plus hypothesis produces a method. So that's, that's kind of like... In some cases, it's valid. I'm not going to challenge it, but it's more restricted. Yeah. So what we end up with, and this is one of those two-by-twos where the best thing isn't going to be in the top right-hand box. I just want to, you know, if there is an expectation, I don't want you to be broken here. Carly, here I have the degree whether I can predict or I can explain. So classic science, yeah, classic scientific method, has a scientific method behind it, and it can make predictive statements. And that's actually quite important, because the ability to predict is key, because it gives us a level of certainty. But that's kind of like only... Re it doesn't really work in social systems. Uh, if you go back to the foundation of sociology in the, 17th, the 18th century, the assumption is that we can create a mathematics of human conditions, and that project has singularly failed. Yeah? Because actually the nature of the system is very different, which I'll come to in a minute. Right? But basically I've got scientific method. Um, we then have this opposite one, which is the most common thing that you see in IT and management systems, which is basically I observe cases. It's the sort of stuff I've been slightly negative about so far. It has value provided you claim explanatory power, not predictive power. Uh, the thing where these go wrong is where people say, therefore, I've got the recipe. If you do this, it will produce the result. At that point, it becomes a form of pseudoscience. Yeah? 
the reality is, as long as you say it's got explanatory power, that's kind of like okay. Yeah? Um, which actually, that is the pseudoscience. Yeah? You know, I've observed this, I've seen these patterns, I've now created a recipe, I've created a consultancy method. If you follow these five steps or three, these three methods, you will get this result. Right? Now, that's pseudoscientific because it's based on observational data without testing of hypotheses. The stuff that I'm working on at Bangor University with colleagues, which is called naturalizing sense-making, um, basically says what natural science does is it provides a constraint. So if we understand what science has proved around systems or about cognitive science or about the way people make decisions, the way systems interoperate, that provides a constraint, a coherence, and therefore we can actually say within those constraint structures what has the lowest energy cost of replication. Yeah? This has major implications, by the way. If I look at the stuff I'm doing on counterterrorism at the moment, Al-Qaeda has a higher energy cost of replication within the same constraints as ISIS-ISIL, which has a low en very low energy cost of replication, which explains why it propagates a lot faster, but also says why you need a containment strategy before you have a destruction strategy. Because if something has a very low energy cost of replication, attempting to destroy it before you contain it will mean it will mutate and spread faster. Uh, which is actually what we're seeing. Yeah? Now, I'm giving that as an illustration because actually if we get the science right, it allows us to make statements before we actually know the outcome, and that's of increasing importance. Yeah? So basically, I'm falling in within that box, yeah? and my job now is to kind of like go through some of the sciences. I should also say that basically the left-hand box can scale, the right-hand box doesn't scale very well because it's dependent on the quality of the original observations. There's no stability in it. So it tends to be more transient in terms of the way it works. So any case-based method is really constrained not only by the cases studied, by the context in which the cases were created. Yeah? A case study in IT from the 1980s will not work yeah, in the current decade simply because the context has shift, shifted, let alone the cases themselves. Yeah? And finally, yeah, kind of like that has value that is actually inappropriate, and that includes natural science within social systems. Yeah? Um, it kind of like ain't going to work, right? and attempts to do it to fail, so we've got to think differently about the problem. Yeah? So let's run through some stuff. First one, complex adaptive systems theory. Now, I could spend a day on any of the sciences I'm going to go through now. I want, I, my job today is to give you an insight into this stuff. Right? The key thing to understand about complex adaptive systems as opposed to ordered systems is that they're dispositional, not causal. Uh, people who are on my warning workshop will know this in more depth. Right? Basically, that means there is no repeating relationship between cause and effect. Yeah, the same thing will only happen again the same way twice by accident, not by the nature of the system. Yeah? The patterns are constantly flexing and changing. Yeah? The scary thing, most human systems are complex. Yeah? An ordered system is one which has such a high level of constraint that everything is predictable. And then the third one to complete the set is a chaotic system where there are no constraints, which is near random, which means completely novel patterns can form. Yeah? Now, just to illustrate this, the, the key principle on this is you need to understand the nature of the system because the nature of the system determines the nature of the way that you can know things. And by definition, models in complex systems are radically different from models in ordered systems. Yeah? They work in very different ways in terms of their expectation. Now, the best way I've learned to explain this is actually to think about managing a party for a bunch of nine-year-old kids. Can everybody imagine this? Yeah? Um, so basically, what I want to do is the basic argument of this theory is depending on which type of system you're in, you will manage the party in a different way. Yeah? So the children's party could be chaotic, ordered, or complex. Yeah? So if it's a chaotic system, it means the children's behavior is entirely random. It lacks constraints or connectivity. Yeah? Oh, and by the way, you've made the mistake of holding this party in your own house. That's a fundamental error, right? Um, you sooner or later learn the value of community centers and church halls because they have fire hoses. And fire hoses are very useful for cleaning up after the party and occasionally necessary for crowd control during the party itself, right? Um, so you're holding it in your own house, right? which is a major mistake. So if you assume it's chaotic, it means you actually allow the children to play without constraint which probably means they discover drugs, alcohol, and automatic weapons, and they go on a rampage, all right? Your house may be destroyed in the process, uh, but it was socially constructed in the first place, so why are you worried about it? There's a stiletto in that for academic colleagues. 
you know, I don't recommend this approach. I've got a friend in California who did try it once. He's never, ever going to do it again because the recovery cost is too high. Yeah? Um, the order systems approach, on the other hand, is taught in all good MBA programs. Yeah? Under this, it's of critical importance to agree learning objectives for the party in advance of the party itself. Yeah? The learning objectives should be aligned with the mission statement for education in a society which you belong. Yeah, and they should be clearly articulated and printed off on motivational posters with pictures of eagles flying over valleys and water dropping into ponds and placed around the room where you're going to hold the party. Yeah? Uh, you then produce a project plan for the party. The project plan should have clear milestones throughout the party against which you can measure progress against ideal party outcome. And as the children come into the party, they should give, be given Disney playing cards with the party value system printed on the back so they're aware of it as they come through. And the senior adult should then start the party with a motivational DVD. You don't want the children you know, wasting time in play, which isn't aligned with the learning objectives. And then they should use PowerPoint to demonstrate their personal commitment to the party objectives. <laughs> and demonstrate to the children how their allowances are linked to the achievement of the milestone targets. Yeah? Following the highly successful completion of the party, you conduct an after-action review update your best practice database on party management and mandate future process improvements. Yeah? If at this stage, for any remote reason, the children aren't happy, you hire an appreciative inquiry practitioner who will get them to tell happy clappy stories so they have happy mental models and suitably indoctrinated the like whatever you put in front of the next time. Everybody reasonably familiar with this approach to party management? Yeah? The complex systems approach, on their hand, is very different. Uh, we start off by drawing some lines in the sand, known as boundaries. And we look the children squarely in the eye, and we say, cross that, you little bastards, and you die. <laughs> and one of the things you learn pretty fast as an adult is the value of flexible, negotiable boundaries, because rigid boundaries have a habit of becoming brittle and breaking catastrophically when you least expect it. Yeah? We then introduce catalytic probes. You know, we throw in a football, you know, give them access to a barbecue, you know, computer gaming. Yeah, we multiple parallel probes to see what actually creates an attractor well, i.e. a pattern of children playing. If it's beneficial, we leave it alone or we give it energy. If it's non-beneficial, well, that's kind of like where we deploy the fire hoses. Yeah? So what we do is we manage the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors within boundaries. And that's a key phrase. Yeah? We manage the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors within boundaries because the only thing we can actually effectively manage are the boundary conditions and the probes and the amplification strategy. Yeah? Now, that simple story actually underpins a whole radical new approach to system design and project management, which is based on boundary conditions, probes, and rapid response mechanisms and feedbacks. Because the thing I satirized for the, part, for the children's party is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis in IT system design. Yeah, we're trying to create an ordered approach to what is fundamentally complex. Yeah. So the key thing to remember at a complex space is it's dispositional, not causal. And this is actual example from a client. This is a dispositional map um, measuring attitudes to safety. Yeah. Um, it's actually a pattern we're getting in both aerospace and also in hospitals, so I've generalized it to show one picture. This is actually based on thousands, or in some cases millions, of field observations by human agents as part of their day-to-day -day work. So we're looking for things like micro-anomalies, not major anomalies. Yeah, anything people notice which is slightly odd, and we're making that part of people's day-to-day -day routine. Yeah, so, for example, with nurses, we're converting nurses' records from end-of-shift report, which is tedious, to observations in the field as you go around, very quickly done. And we're using a concept called high abstraction metadata, I'm going to come into in a minute. Right? So I've got multiple real-time observations by human agents. From that, this is a variation of something called a fitness landscape in the literature. It measures a dispositional state. Now on this, interestingly, the vertical dimension is rule compliance, the horizontal dimension is job completion. So you can see we've got a significant problem here. Yeah? We've got one group, of one dominant pattern, which is rule completion, job, comple you know, job completion, rule compliance. Uh, when you actually look at that in aerospace, it turns out to be nuclear weapons testing, which kind of like creates a context in which both are kind of like accepted. Yeah? In, in nurses, it's actually operating theaters. 
Yeah, in an operating theatre, you've got the context in which a pattern of behaviour is possible. The scary thing is you've got this other one, is we get the job done and to hell with the rules. Yeah, this is coming from British hospitals at the moment, where basically to provide empathetic care to patients, nurses have to break the rules. If they followed the rules, patient care wouldn't be done. And you've got this growing pattern here of what I call despair, i.e. we're just going to survive. Yeah? Now the fact we've got the same pattern in aerospace as we've actually got in hospitals tells you something about a modern rule-controlled world. Yeah? And that measures attitudes, and attitudes are a lead indicator, whereas compliance is a lag indicator. We're now actually doing this work on attitudes to software testing. Yeah, because if I can measure attitudes to testing, I've got a lead indicator if, if I should pay more attention, whereas compliance is a lag indicator. Yeah? Because what we're doing is we're measuring the disposition of the system. How is it disposed to work, not what do people say? I should say in all the cases here, when interviewed, people say they're doing the job and they're, getting the, they're following the rules. Because that's what they know is, is what they're meant to do. Oh, and if you don't know, by the way, questionnaires are fakely flawed by their hypotheses. Um, by work groups are biased within 15 minutes by the facilitator. I could go down the route, all right? Um, there's a whole body of cognitive biases that come in on that. Now, this is actually, you see where the two arrows are pointing. That's called an adjacent possible in complexity theory. Yeah? Now, that is adjacent. It's a, it's a small attractor well adjacent to where we currently are. So I can shift things in that direction to shift things to the top right is too far. This is actually becoming really important in system design. You can't create a system based on how things should be. You have to create a system on how things are and nudge it in the right direction. So the ability to see where a system is able to go rather than where you would like it to go becomes a new criticality in terms of the way we do work. Yeah. There's some other scary stuff on this as well I'll come into in a minute. But that indicates a whole new approach to actually change. But also, you'll see me bring this back in when I talk about user requirements capture. The next thing is, and you know, if anybody's about to have an x-ray panic, this has been replicated many times. Now remember, radiologists are highly trained individuals working with a very restricted information set. Yeah, compared with what you have to model, all right? Yeah, these guys don't really have any problems. All right? They're dealing with a very restricted information set. It's a very long training process. You give them a batch of x-rays and ask them to look for a cancer nodule, and on one of the x-rays, you hide a picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule, and they've been asked to look for anomalies, all right? Over 80% don't see it, even though their eyes physically scan it. Yeah? And actually, you can't train people to do otherwise. Right? And basically, we do not see what we do not expect to see. It's called inattentional blindness. The good news is there's a lot out there to discover if only we looked at the world differently. Yeah, there is, there's a, a good upside to this. Right? Now, the reason behind this is the most you scan of what's in front of you is about 3 or 4% on a good day if you're paying attention. Yeah, if you're Chinese, it goes up to 10%. Uh, interesting object context difference, and that's actually a, you know, the difference between symbolic languages and non-symbolic languages is produces a difference. Yeah? If you give Chinese students a picture of a tiger drinking from a stream in the forest, they see the forest and miss the tiger. If you show the same picture to American students, they see the tiger and don't notice the forest. It's actually linked with the need to understand context on symbolic languages. And actually, it explains the difference in their foreign policy if you look at it. And I'm being deadly serious when I say that, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, symbolic language cultures look more at contextual change, not at object change. They less focus on objects. And that produces a radical difference. Yeah? Either way, this stuff is actually quite scary if you think about it. So most people in this audience will scan 3, 4, 4%. A radiologist then has 30, 40,000 patterns yeah, which actually they filter through, so the patterns in their brain, their body, and their tools. The most frequently used ones are activated first. So what they actually do, based on a partial data scan, is they do a first fit pattern match, not a best fit pattern match. Yeah, and that's how we evolve to make decisions. Yeah, my father was a veterinary surgeon, which was quite interesting when I grew up. It's why I did theoretical physics and philosophy at university. Yeah, if your father forces you to do sheath washings on a bull on the early hours of a January morning surrounded by elderly males when you're just in puberty, you decide anything but this for the rest of my life, all right? Um, and it also meant we kept vets don't trust doctors, so I always went to the chemist with for animal use only prescriptions until I got to university, all right? But, you know, they have two years more training. 
He, was one of the, he actually spotted rabies in a British containment camp one day before a dog was going to be released. If you know in Britain, we actually put dogs into quarantine, or did. Yeah, six months quarantine, right? Because we have a slaughter policy. So if a rabid animal gets loose, all right, every mammal within one mile will be exterminated. Uh, human beings are exempt from this. The vets don't really agree with that. All right? <laughs> they think it's bad containment strategy, and the, the, the humans probably brought the thing in in the first place. All right? But you know, so the cost is huge. So it was manifested in a non-typical way. He spotted it the day before it was released. And he got all sorts of awards. And I remember, yeah, I'm 14 years old. You know, Dad's got awards. You want to know why, all right? And he said, well, first of all, I saw rabies because he was in the Royal Army Veterinary Corps during the last war. Yeah, and he served in Afghanistan and Egypt, yeah? um, which was cool in the 60s because he had a real Afghanistan coat. That gave me huge street cred in Berlin in the 60s, all right? Having a real <laughs> Afghan coat. I should remember that one, all right? Um, but he said, I wouldn't have remembered it if I hadn't been telling the story about the rabid jackal hunt the night before, so it was on my mind. Yeah? Now, if you actually look at the history of successful counterterrorism, it's when people notice something which just happened to be on their mind. It wasn't a structured search or modeling approach. Yeah? And that has major implications yeah? in terms of the way we represent and detect things. Now, in evolutionary terms, you can see why this happened. If you think about the early hominoids on the savannas of Africa, Something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed. Yeah? Do you want to autistically scan all available data, yeah? look up a catalogue of the flora and fauna of the African veldt, and having identified lion, look up best practice case studies in how to deal with lions? Yeah? Uh, by that time, the only document of any use to you will be the book of Jonah from the Old Testament, <laughs> which is the only example I've found of how to escape from the digestive tract of a large carnival. Yeah? Uh, we evolved to make decisions very, very quickly based on a partial data scan privilege in our most recent experience. Okay, what happens when you announce a new software initiative? What's the pattern it falls into? You have all previous software initiatives produce huge success and you know, people enjoy this acclamation of the value of the IT department. Or have there been a series of neo-catastrophic -catastroph failures from which you just about recovered by deluding the users about what they really wanted, right? I mean, the whole point about data flow diagrams is that you can blame users for things they didn't understand, but we can hold them accountable for later, right? And entity models the same way. Right? Yeah, fundamentally, we are pattern-based collective intelligences, and we privilege our most recent experience, yeah? which is actually why if you're going to do a change initiative, the last thing you should do in a modern company is announce a change initiative. Uh, because you can't like doom it to failure. Yeah? But that's key because it means when a systems analyst goes to interview a user, they've already preformed the pattern as they do the interview. Not only that, once they've conducted two interviews, they form a subconscious hypothesis, and literally they only hear things that match that hypothesis they're after. Yeah? And the only people who don't do that are people who are fully autistic, and they can't go out and do the interviews anyway because they get too much inf in information. Yeah? Now, this is what we call a new realism. It's kind of like, don't try and pretend this doesn't happen or try and train people not to do it. Work with it. Yeah? So one of the examples of the way we do this, and I was telling the group this morning, I had to do a big conference, 2,500 intelligence agents in um, Tampa, Florida, which meant it took me longer to get into the conference through the security processes than it actually took anything else. And the hotel standard was, shall we say, cheap and nasty, right? DARPA regulations. And I was invited to this well before my namesake became famous, but they seized the day and actually put me on first and announced that Snowden was keynoting at their conference <laughs> and didn't say which Snowden. So kind of like we maxed out on the attendance, all right? But what we did there, and this is kind of like the approach we developed originally under DARPA funding before 9-11, we actually presented an inf infographic on Syria to the entire audience. They interpreted it onto the high abstraction metadata in 20 seconds, and 10 seconds later, we actually presented a fit, two fitness landscapes back for two communities, which showed the dominant and the minority views. Now, go back to the gorilla. What we're saying is we'll get multiple agents in real time to interpret something. We'll show the patterns of that interpretation so the minority and the majority views become visible. Yeah? We're now moving that onto a real-time data decision model in which it works off the waggle dance of bees by which a swarm of bees all the bees go out to find a new hive. They come back, they dance on the swarm, and the intensity of the dance and the direction of the dance indicates where the, where the source is. Other bees go to investigate it. You get these reinforcement patterns, and all of a sudden the swarm leaves. 
We're now using that over two to three hour sessions, over two or three thousand agents to make decisions at a corporate level. Yeah? Now, now, what I'm trying to do is science plus what we do about it. Yeah? We know that human beings are biased in that way. We stop trying to pretend that we can change it. We build systems which actually use the bias to its advantage rather than the other way around. Yeah? So that's kind of like a pattern there. Um, something else, this is a picture of René Descartes. Um, lots of things go wrong with René Descartes. Historically, you have to remember, this is a time when Galileo um, is being threatened with being burned to life if he doesn't recant. And for some reason, Descartes is nervous in consequence. All right? um, so what he actually does, this is Midgley's explanation of why he came about it. We have, I think, therefore I am, the separation of the body from the soul. Yeah, because what that does is the, the, the mind is the church's matter and the body is science's matter. So what he de facto does is create a space for science. Yeah, and that, that's, the, that's a, a strong argument now in, in the history of philosophy as to why it happened. The trouble is the separation of the mind and the body has become endemic in human systems. We, we like these sort of dualisms. It allows us to believe that computers can replace human brains. Uh, anybody heard about the singularity? It's this concept, there's a point coming in time at which you'll be able to transfer a human brain to a computer. Wonderfully satirized in Big Bang Theory, by the way, when Sheldon realizes his expected lifespan is three years before the anticipated day of... of yeah, and it's a very funny episode, that, right? If you genuinely believe that your brain could be transferred to a computer, it's probably ossified to the point where it may be possible for you, right? Um, the thing we actually now know is that consciousness is a distributed function of the brain, the body, and its environment. Yet actually, artifacts are part of collective consciousness in the social context of their delivery, and there are whole aspects of what you know which actually require physical change. London taxi drivers have to drive the streets of London for two to three years on mopeds till they know the name of every street, and they're given any two points in London. They have to tell the route out and the route back it's a 40% pass rate over multiple attempts. Yeah? The hippocampus is enlarged compared with other human beings, and it takes two years. Yeah, that's where the capacity comes, along with ethics, by the way. Ethics go with professional institutions, which don't go with Uber. Yeah? The process of going through a process of professional of apprenticeship with a body of people over time creates ethical constraints, whereas actually just being a commodity supply doesn't. Yeah? And we're actually arguing strongly to keep the London taxi driver service because actually it provides a, sen a human sensor network across the whole of London which knows London backwards and can respond in real time. Yeah, and that sort of capacity is becoming more important. Uh, in Australia, they don't let young children drive with passengers other than parents yeah, until they've had two years of driving experience. Because it takes two years for your brain and body to co-evolve to the point where you can drive and pay attention to a conversation safely. Yeah. It's no coincidence apprentice models take two or three years. Yeah. All the evidence is that key IT skills take four or five years of apprenticeship minimum before you can actually be said to exhibit them. Yeah. But we're reducing everything to information. We're actually, education is now becoming a process of implanting information rather than creating knowledge. Yeah, that's deeply problematic yeah, in terms of the way it works. And that need for apprentice models come through and the science backs it up. Okay. The second one, and this is fascinating, is cave painting comes before language in human evolution. We learnt to draw before we learnt to speak. And actually, that's why we are what we are. Because if you look at Cretaceous languages and ape languages, they name things, so they've got a Dunbar's number limit in terms of the vocabulary. Our language evolved from abstractions, uh, which actually makes us hugely adaptive, because if you move up a level of abstraction, you see novel connections between things. Yeah, again, if you actually look at some of the studies which have been done on theoretical physics, physicists who've made major breakthroughs, they tend to be musicians or poets. And part of the argument is the abstraction allows them to make novel connections. Yeah, so the evolutionary argument is by shifting up through art, we can repurpose things very quickly, and that's been a key part of our species development, which actually means focusing on STEM education is to damage people's education. Yeah, if, you, if people don't have art, they actually lose intelligence in the process. It's not just an information transfer mechanism. Right? But it has major implications for data modeling. What we can write down is 5% of what we know on a good day. Yeah? It's always been the problem with data analytics. It's over-focused on text, and it hasn't focused on human knowledge and capability. 
To, to take a quote from Polanyi and extend it, we always know more than we can say, we will always say more than we can write down. Actually, it's been a lot easier to get this across since the Internet of Things came along, because the Internet of Things has stopped the dominance of data analytics, and we're now into much more sophisticated mechanisms. Right? So we've got to be very careful on this, but abstraction is key. The other issue is cognitive load. If I increase the cognitive load on the brain, that's where you move from thinking fast to thinking slow, to use Kleinman's terms. You don't make that shift unless thinking fast has stopped working. Yeah, so that's the cognitive load. So from that, we get a key principle of what we call high abstraction metadata. Yeah. Now, this is something we developed, we patented in the context of biology, and it's actually very simple. You have to patent very simple things because they're too easy to copy. Um, everybody's done an employee satisfaction survey at some time in their life? Yeah, I, I got this one from IBM, all right. It says, does your manager consult you on a regular basis, scale of zero, not at all, 10 all the time? Everybody familiar with that one? And you know exactly what answer they want. So I, I phoned up HR to seek explanation. I got straight through to the worldwide VP. Uh, my name was on a blacklist. I'd run a six-month controlled test, which had proved astrology was more accurate than Myers-Briggs in predicting team behavior. <laughs> and they tried to have me fired for it. And I then understand that <laughs> IBM corporate HR directors do not understand ironic research, all right? So it becomes... <laughs> Uh, there's no scientific origin behind Myers-Briggs whatsoever, if you didn't know about it. It's, it's one of the pseudosciences, along with NLP and spiral dynamics and those sort of things. All right? No scientific basis whatsoever. Yeah. Either way, so I said, how am I meant to answer this? I've got several managers. Some of them consult me, some of them don't. Sometimes they should, sometimes they shouldn't. And she said, average your experience over the year and stop making trouble. All right? Now, <laughs> the phone was put down me as I was about to say, and you think you're HR in a research department, so it's probably a good job the phone was put down on me because that would have been probably a stage too far. Right? Um, the reality is it's problematic. Right? Because you've got, first of all, you ask the direct question so you know what answer they want. Yeah? So you'll gift or you'll game it. Secondly, you've seen people fill out a questionnaire. You'll do it when you do the conference assessment. You just go cross, cross, cross. You're not thinking. You're an automatic pilot. Yeah? And that's not good enough for the sort of thing we want to go deeper. So we take a very different approach. We go to, say, a third of the workforce every quarter or 10% every month. And we have two questions. I'll make one and the second. The first one is, what story would you tell your best friend if they were off the job in the company? Yeah, that's called a hypothesis. Yeah, free question. Then we ask people to interpret the story. And we say the manager's behavior, where did it sit between three elements, was it altruistic, assertive, or analytical? Start to see where this goes? We're doing the same with 360 now. So a manager nominates any number of people. Every time they interact with the manager, they basically index it onto six triangles. The manager gets real-time feedback, no sort of annual appraisal technique, but an immediate, this is the pattern. Yeah? The other one we use a lot is give us an example of a decision made recently which affected you personally. This is key on user requirements captured, by the way. Yeah, capturing people's decisions through decision diaries is more valuable than interviewing them. So we take a whole sample of the population and say, every time you make a decision or you're a, wit you're a witness to a decision, make a note about it and interpret it. Yeah? Now, one of the triads on that is this one, which will illustrate the problem. So we say, in this situation, it was analyzed logically, we acted intuitively, people thought deeply about their decisions. And they're placing their story into six triangles. Now, key, this is descriptive, not evaluative. Description opens up possibilities, evaluation closes them down. That's the overall pattern. So I can see this company is actually pretty good analytically. Yeah, not too bad under principles, but I would question some of the ethics uh, under stress, and God help them in a crisis. So the responsibility now of HR is to actually increase the distribution of that over the next year. And this is called a vector target, not an outcome target. This is what we're doing in the health service and elsewhere. Vectors measure direction and speed of travel from the present rather than specifying an endpoint, which you can't do in a complex system anyway. Yeah? So this gives us a huge amount of metadata very quickly. Now, the big projects we're now running, we've run these on four continents, and we're now running them on a more controlled basis in Wales. It's, uh, for example, in Pakistan, we sent every child out from 200 schools to go to the people in their grandparents, their parents, their own generation, and ask them for the story that that, that generation thought the child should remember. This is a cultural mapping exercise. They interpreted it onto six triangles drawn from cultural anthropology. 
And we actually had those fitness landscapes coming in in real time during the research. Everybody else gathered the stories, transcribed the stories, analyzed the stories, reported a report. Our stuff was self-interpreted at the point of origin. Now, what's interesting about this is we've done controlled tests of human metadata over machine over text interpretation. So one of the projects I'm proud is of, we've got young girls who've been subject to genital mutilation and rape who are now acting as ethnographers to people at risk in their own communities, which is actually more therapeutic than being counseled. You know, trying to stop other people go through the hell you've been through has a better effect on humans. We then take that data interpreted by the girls, we give it to experts in Washington and The Hague and London, and they don't interpret it in the same way. Not only that, the girls interpret it very broadly with multiple intervention possibilities because they're describing a situation. The experts evaluate, so you end up with one or two narrow interpretations. Right? Now, we're finding very interesting things. Right? Expert interpretation doesn't match people's interpretation. Computer interpretation on sentiment and analysis doesn't match it either. And we now run intelligent sector trial trends like this against sentiment analysis, and this wins at all times. Yeah? Because there's more to life than the story which is written down. The story is a starting point. People are adding layers of meaning. Yeah? And that's also how we do the wisdom of the crowds and all those other factors. Yeah? Very fast capture. The interesting thing about this is the sensor mechanism we're building in Wales at the moment is every 16-year-old in every school will go into their community every month to capture data. That replaces polling and focus groups, and it gives us access to the street stories on a real-time basis. I was fighting this for a long time till Brexit came along, and Brexit may be a disaster for the British economy, but it's quite useful for my business. Yeah, because all of a sudden everybody wants to know what the fuck was going on, all right? So kind of like anything which gets the street stories is actually quite powerful. Uh, we're deploying in Colombia as well at the moment for similar reasons. Yeah? So kind of like if you're interested in that, there's more on that. That's actually from the Girl Hub one, which is there. Um, again, showing those fitness landscapes, all right? This is what we actually derive from that. If I've got six triangles, I've got 18 points. Remember I talked about getting the system to model itself? What I'm doing is getting the system to continuously give me feedback with explanatory anecdotal material. And the explanatory stuff is key. I go from a statistical pattern in the maths to the explanatory narrative. So what we're now doing with user requirements capture is capture those decisions continuously, get people to interpret their decisions. When the decision clusters reach a critical mass, you're automatically allocated $5,000 to apply a pair programming team to produce a prototype to see if you can do something for it. Because what we're trying to do is to actually get the unarticulated needs surfaced rather than wait for users to ask for something. Yeah, kind of like an early stage process. All right? And there's more than that. There'll be a big program announced on this shortly through the university. We're going to run a 12-month multi-client participatory process for people interested in that to further refine it. But it gives an idea. And of course, those might be board level, but these are then factory levels. This is actually called fractal representation. So we do this on safety auditing. This is the board position. This is the factory position. This is the work group position, all coming from the same data. Hospital, nurse, ward, any level. You're always going from the same source data. But again, actually, the system is modeling itself. Now, some bright guys in the computer modeling department are starting to realize we can feed their models better. So this stuff can actually feed the assumptions, and then you can use the data to do simulation. Yeah, and that, that restricts the cognitive bias of model creation right, in terms of the way it works. Final couple of things to throw in. Um, acceptation, a key aspect of evolutionary biology. Um, this kind of like was the nail in the coffin for Dawkins and you know, anybody who's created a new religion called scientism, of which he's the first prophet, deserves having nails in his coffin. Um, evolution isn't a linear process of adaptation. I mean, one of the arguments that creationists used to have and sorry, I have to deal with creationists because I spend a lot of my time in Dallas where I'm working with the Ebola management teams and I'm not allowed to mention evolution because it's a controversial theory. All right? These are the Ebola management teams. All right? Get really scared. All right? um, basically, the argument they had is there's not enough time in the fossil record for intelligence to develop in humans, and they're right. In a linear sense, there just ain't enough time. But we discovered in a variety of ways. The one I like is dinosaur's feathers. So you can see dinosaur's feathers in the, in the fossil record. They evolve almost certainly for warmth, yeah, maybe sexual display. And you can see that as a linear process. No dinosaur has to die for the next you know, yeah, iteration to come. And then a group of very feathery dinosaurs turn out to be arboreal, which means they fall out of trees. 
and they've got lots of feathers, so they glide. And that's how flight starts. Yeah, a, a trait which evolves for one function under conditions of stress accepts for another. Uh, digits developed in mammal in in fish life before fish came on the, on the land. Yeah, they were didn't they were fins didn't become that. The other lovely example is the cerebellum at the base of your brain evolved to manipulate muscles in fingers. It then accepts to manage grammar in human language. Yeah, the huge sophistication of human language couldn't happen in a linear way. It required a non-linear change. 1945, a Raytheon engineer maintaining the magneto of a radar machine notices that a chocolate bar melts in their pocket. We get microwave ovens. Yeah, Apple are masters of exaptive design. They find something which has been highly evolved for one function and they repurpose it for something else. Yeah? Exaptation is key to innovation and to my mind to design. Now in order to actually architect for exaptation, you have to architect for things to connect, guess what, at a higher level of abstraction. Yeah? Because actually, one, to give an example of a project, we actually got 3,000 stories in, in a week indexed by people about their gardens. This is a marketing project. We got people in technical silos of a major lighting company to index all of their technical capability on the same triad set. So now I've got abstract metadata, human interpreted. I mashed the databases together at an abstract level. I got five clusters. Marketing then looked at the five clusters. Three of them are now multi-million dollar businesses. Because it was why has that technology been linked with those stories? And that actually provided the, the trigger mechanism for people to see how they could rapidly repurpose. That's what we're about to start with technology, capability, user needs, cures, obesity management. It's called an exaptive database or an exaptive learning mechanism. We learn best when we encounter things which are novel in unexpected ways on a continuous basis. Yeah. And remember, for everybody who notices that a chocolate bar melts in their pocket and sees the significance, there are probably 500 people who swear and have their trousers cleaned. Yeah. So actually managing so that what I call small notices become visible now becomes a critical aspect of design. And with modern technology, we can do this at scale over huge populations, which we couldn't do before. Yet the trouble is we're not using technology to augment human intelligence. We're using it to try and replace it. Yeah, and that's kind of like a mistake in terms of the way we work. Um, I'll mention this briefly for the Star Trek fans amongst you. Um, we do a... Yeah, you either get this one or you don't, all right? Sorry, I did my homework to Star Trek, the first generation, when I was doing physics. Um, basically, it's a game in which you're doomed to fail. We've actually found that human-managed simulation games yeah, with computer augmentation in which people continuously fail increase the amount of data scan before a decision made by a factor of 25, whereas actually games where people win which are computer-based make the winners arrogant. Yeah? And actually, human games masters are far more malicious than computers and far cheaper to assemble and deal with different contexts. Now, a famous one we did for the US is we built an alternative history of the US in which the South win the Civil War. Yeah, it's actually quite easy to forecast that. It's, it's Lincoln doesn't play the slavery card at two years in. Right? Um, and I won't tell you what happened because we had enormous fun with 25 historians for a week developing a full theory of the US under this, this strategy. Right? It was highly entertaining. Right? We now take an example from that case, we put current policymakers in it, in a game environment, and they explore through the metaphor things they would never explore in the real situation. We've done the same in industry, where we send anthropologists in, we study the company, we then sit down with science fiction writers, we construct an alien planet in which the planet culture represents the company, and then we land managers in a game, and they find solutions they wouldn't find if they were talking about the real problem. Shift into abstraction again. Yeah. And again, what we're doing is we're creating multiple small human-based models of what's possible before we move into design. Yeah. I'm not trying to challenge data modeling. I'm just saying there's more stuff we need to do on the design phase before it. So kind of like a couple to conclude. Uh, karma isn't silicon. Anybody remember the Horta? Anybody old enough to remember this? OK. Uh, one of the great creations, I think it was episode two of Star Trek, all right? Um, in which they discover a silicon-based life form. They actually think it's rock, so it's been mined, but they're actually destroying the eggs, and Spock has to do a mine meld, right? It's a wonderful episode. Um, the point I'm making is computers are very different from humans. Computers work effectively or autistic in human terms. Now, the danger is, there's an old joke about this, 
Will computers exceed human beings in intelligence in the next 50 years? To which the answer is yes, because at the moment we're planning to meet them halfway. Yeah, we're reducing our capacity to use abstraction and think generally. We're moving ourselves into rigid processes. Well, computers are better at that, right? So kind of like we need to balance the two of it. And I'm strongly arguing, in effect, that we need to think slightly differently about this. So I say, this is Daniel in Lion's Den, all right? I haven't been talking about data modeling. My brief wasn't to do that. My brief was to try and create a wider context. Yeah? What natural science tells us and the biological end of anthropology tells us is what systems have evolved to be and how people have evolved to make decisions. Once you've got that, you can design better systems, better models. If you start with what the model should be, you're never going to get anywhere. Or you will get somewhere, but it will always be partial. Yeah? So the argument is augmentation, not replacement. And basically, start to use science as a constraint, but also a means of revealing new possibilities in terms of the way we work. Yeah? So I hope that's useful. Open to questions. Or to silence, or to coffee. <laughs>